The next uh, talk is very much about experimentation and testing, so, so I think it really belongs with us. It's Nick Reed from TRL. Thank you, Hugh, and uh, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, right. Excellent. Yeah, so um, Hugh asked it for me to speak around some of my experiences in uh, undertaking work related to modelling and simulation. So I've got um, really three things to talk about today, and, and two of them are, are some of the trials and, and projects that we've run where we've encountered some challenges around modelling and simulation. And then the last one is, is really a, a plea, I guess, for um, developments around uh, future modelling facilities, modelling capabilities that we need uh, as we go into a, a connected and automated future. So I'm going to start talking about some work we did related to platooning. Now I'm sure you know platooning is uh, this picture from the Sartre trials uh, around uh, the turn of the decade. Um, the idea that you have a lead vehicle uh, and the lead vehicle is manually driven or at least um, uh, there's a human at the controls perhaps quite assisted but um, a, a manually driven vehicle and the vehicles following that lead vehicle are uh, connected electronically so that the following vehicles can follow more closely and benefit from a, an aerodynamic effect resulting in, in better fuel efficiency. And in terms of the, the modelling task, we, I was interested in understanding what difference that could make to network uh, performance. What, what would it mean for the, the ability to run more traffic uh, along the roads if a number of vehicles were involved in platoons? They're taking up less space on the road uh, and, and perhaps that could improve network performance. So we uh, did some adaptation of a, a VISIM model and we were looking at what would be the change if it was only trucks that were involved in platoons. So that's the, the graph on the, the left of the screen. Um, and you can see that as you go across the x-axis, we're looking at the increase in the percentage of trucks involved in platooning. And on the y-axis, it's the uh, increase in network capacity that is seen when you have um, that proportion of, of trucks platooning. And the, because trucks represent a relatively small proportion of the number of vehicles on the network, even at 50% of um, uh, HGVs on the road being in road trains in these platoons, we're only getting a, around a 2% improvement in network performance uh, across the, the, the carriageway. However, if we move to the, the right-hand graph, where we're looking at the um, platoons involving cars and trucks, the increase in uh, um, capacity on the network is essentially proportional to the, um, the percentage of vehicles involved in road trains. So if you have 20% of the vehicles, trucks and cars involved in platoons, you get a 20% increase in uh, network capacity, which is, which is great. It's a, it's a really interesting finding. But this wasn't uh, without challenges. So in doing that, we did, we did find some useful information, but it was a really uh, difficult task to manipulate VISIM to uh, do the kind of platooning um, that we wanted. And effectively, what we had to do was, rather than create platoons of individual vehicles, vehicles involved in platoons were joined together to make one very large vehicle to model the, the uh, behaviour of that um, platoon on the motorway. And we couldn't look at the process by which uh, vehicles would join and leave platoons, which I think would have been very interesting as well. And as, as we move towards trials, real-world trials of platooning in the UK coming next year, um, kind of developing the software to en enable us to look at those issues and understand where platooning would make most sense on the network would be really, really useful. Okay, I also wanted to talk about um, some work we did with our driving simulator, DigiCar. So DigiCar is, is the, the image on the left. It's a, a Honda Civic. It has a, a three degrees of freedom motion system, so it will give you pitch and roll and vertical movement. It's surrounded by a display screen, so when you're sat in the car, essentially all you can see are, are the graphics around you, and, and you use the controls as you would. Normally gives a very realistic um, driving experience. But one of, the, one of the frustrations I have is that when you buy the, the software or you buy your simulator, I think the, the simulator providers should be giving you some sort of evidence that when people use your simulator, they're, doing, they're driving in a realistic way. But uh, we decided we would do our own validation tests to make sure that when people come to our simulator, they are behaving in a way that's at least representative of how they behave in the real world. So what we did, we got um, a, a real 
Honda Civic, and, it, and in fact, it was the same colour as well, which was, which was helpful. Um, but we got uh, a number of participants to drive in the real car on a test track and perform a number of uh, predetermined manoeuvres. And then we had an exact replication of that test track and we asked them to do the same manoeuvres in, in the simulator and we compare the data between the two. We had a telematics device in the car and we could record um, data around speed and position and compare that with the same data we could get from the simulator. And we got some really good results. So this is, this is um, positional data. The, um, the, the, bar, the kind of lines, uh, error bars are showing the speed at those points and the, the, the actual data point is the position. And following a curve around the test track, we got a very nice match between the, the car and the, the, the simulator. If we look at um, accelerating and decelerating from a junction, again, a really nice correspondence between speeds in the simulator and speed in the real vehicle. And the actual speed choice as well. We had a, a section where they were required to cruise at a constant speed uh, and the, the, the speed chosen and the variation in that speed was, was very similar between the two. But I wanted to highlight one, one thing that we found in an earlier study uh, where we were using our driving simulator to look at the uh, behaviour of participants when there was a brake assist system present in the vehicle. And the graph here shows on the x-axis the uh, level of brake pedal application from zero to full brake pedal and then the level of deceleration that the vehicle experiences when you press the brake. So, you got the, the solid line here, which is like the expected um, relationship between brake pedal position and expected deceleration. And the vast majority of the data points fit that line very, very closely, which is, which is great. But you've got these points down here where even at maximum brake pedal application, there's zero deceleration. And these data points here, which even at full, uh, at full application of the brake pedal, there's a a marked variation in the amount of deceleration that the vehicle experiences. And what, we, what this was due to is that while the simulator is brilliant for the kind of macro driving that it feels very realistic, some of the detail around what the model is doing actually misses, it, 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 it's, the, the, the detail isn't quite matching up to the overall experience for the driver. So some of the detail behind the simulation whether that's down to um, poor sensors or poor um, software interpretation of what the sensors are doing, that's not important if you're just looking at the uh, representative behavior in, in the real world. But if you're looking at the detailed um, uh, performance of a braking assist system, then this does become really important. And we, we changed and improved our software as a result of the, these findings. Now, the last, um, the last uh, kind of story to tell, really, is, is around one of the, the key topics of the day, really, connected and automated vehicles. And this uh, video is one I took in, um, in Mountain View. We had a, a meeting with Google, and, and, and ahead of the, the meeting, we went to... Clearly, this is one of their, their self-driving cars. Ahead of the meeting, we, we had a, a coffee in a, a cafe nearby. And uh, we spotted one of these vehicles going past, so dashed out, take to get a video footage of it uh, of it passing didn't realize that five minutes later another one came past five minutes later another one and another one and another one and uh, as it turns out you know we went to the facilities where they've got these vehicles parked up they're just coming and going all the time repeating different uh, journeys collecting huge amounts of data uh, around real driving but then also feeding that data into their simulations of, of driving uh, performance to help improve their algorithms that control the connected and automated vehicle. So yeah, they're doing a lot, 20,000 of miles of automated driving uh, data per month. And this is from uh, yeah, our own um, automated vehicle project in Greenwich. It's, the, um, it's a 3D laser point cloud created by Oxbotica. Um, and it's a, an animation of our shuttle vehicle that we'll be testing uh, next year. Um, operating in this laser point cloud. And it's using the laser point cloud environment to learn its route, understand where it is, where it needs to go, and what uh, obstacles there might be in its path. And comparing that to the sensors on board the vehicle in the real driving uh, situation, it, uh, it can navigate safely in a, in a self-driving manner. But really, what um, the, the point around connecting automated vehicles, it's something that, that hasn't been mentioned yet today, is how we go about verifying and validating the performance of a connected and automated vehicle. 
So, you know, when we validate the performance of a, a real vehicle, a human-driven vehicle, we might send it to a test track, make sure it, it brakes and steers and operates in the way we would expect. And then we, send, we sell it and we see what happens with, with human drivers. In, a, in the world of a connected and automated vehicle, we might need to do a lot more to assure ourselves that a vehicle will behave safely when we send it out into the world. Now, we can't do that efficiently on test tracks because we may need many millions of miles, many different types of weather situation, many different types of obstacle that we need to model before we have the confidence that the vehicle will behave safely out in the real world. So we need to move to a situation where we can use virtual synthetic tools for simulating the performance of automated vehicles to give us the confidence that they will behave as we expect and we can, uh, we can sell them and use them safely out in the real world. Now there's a big challenge around how you um, validate that those models are uh, suitable, they're fit for purpose. Are we sure that that model uh, that is uh, simulating the effect of rain on the behaviour of a sensor, on the behaviour of uh, a braking uh, system is realistic? But you know, different manufacturers have come up with different millions or billions of miles that are needed to validate the performance of automated vehicles. We're going to need to use these synthetic tools to do that efficiently. So just in closing, I, I don't think anyone would agree that we need to have all these features in our models. We need to have flexibility to change and adapt our models to look at new types of, of situation. We need the sophistication to um, be able to deal with detailed and, and, and highly sophisticated uh, features and, and um, situations. And we need to ensure that those models are indeed valid and what we are modelling, the questions we're asking of our models are being answered in a, in a suitable and appropriate way. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you.